Running, though, is very different. Uh, running, again, it's a straight ahead activity. It's a bipedal human activity we, we all do or hopefully can do. But it has been uh, suggested as of 50 years ago that they should be different names for these phases. We have a foot strike as being the contact phase, mid support as being mid stance, and toe off as being the propulsive phase in the terminology used by Slocum and James in 68. And then the time to swing phase with these forward recovery phase, the time your foot's off the ground, we have follow through when the thigh is going backwards, forward swing when the thigh is going forwards, and foot descent from the time the thigh is most forwards to the time it hits the ground again. So when we look at running, uh, and the video is a little jerkier than it is, but hopefully it will be usable here. Here is a slow motion run. Here is our heel strike in running. Again, only about 250 milliseconds. So if this all occurs, the stance phase or support phase only occurs in one quarter of a second. Fourth loading. Here is the middle mid support where the center of mass is directly over the foot in running. Heel off when the heel is coming off the ground. That's the start of the... Uh, push off phase, toe off, there's when the toes in the ground. Now here's the, what we'll call the double float phase. In running, that's always with both feet off the ground. Doesn't occur with walking, follow through. There's our forward swing. And then at the end of forward swing, we go into the foot descent phase, where the foot's going to the ground. And that ends at the uh, heel contact phase of running. So, one of the things I want to emphasize in this lecture are what are the kinematic and kinetic differences between walking and running during the uh, gait cycle. Number one, uh, as I said before, the double float phase only occurs in running. The ground reaction force versus the time curves, uh, ground reaction force being measured by force plates is going to be very different between walking and running. Ground reaction force is greatly increased in running versus walking. The potential and kinetic energy exchanges between walking and running are very different. And that's actually probably the biggest difference between walking and running are how kinetic and uh, potential energy are exchanged. Uh, varus alignment of the lower extremity is increased in faster running. Rear foot pronation, velocity, acceleration are increased in running versus walking. And also EMG activity is increased more in running and walking. So we talked about the double float phase. The double float phase basically means during the forward recovery phase, uh, we are, during part of that time, we are both feet off the ground. When you look at, if you actually look at a, a walking gait, there's always going to be a time during gait where both feet are on the ground. You don't see that in running. In fact, in race walking, there's a term called for when both feet are off the ground where they could try to go faster and they'd get disqualified, and that's called lifting. And if you see here, I don't know if you can see this, here is a, a, a race walker who's going to be disqualified because she is actually has both feet off the ground. That's a disqualification. So by definition, as soon as they lift both feet off the ground, they get a double flow phase. That's disqualification from a race walking event. So when we look at ground reaction force versus time, in walking, it's a very characteristic curve. And of course, this is going to be time on the bottom here. And the magnitude of ground reaction force, these are the, these are the vertical forces. These aren't the 4F shear or medial lateral shear forces, just Z forces that are directly vertical. Is that in walking, we have what we call a double hump curve, where this is, corresponds to when the heel is hitting the ground, the middle part, oh, I think my battery is, okay, my battery, if, if uh, AV people can bring another laser pointer up, I'd appreciate it, because mine is dying. Um, the second hump is when the foot's, uh, the uh, uh, heel's coming off the ground, and in the middle you can see the ground reaction force is actually less than uh, when we have, um, uh, than, than their normal body weight. The trough between the curves is about 80% body weight. The, actually, the peak of the curves is about 1.1 to 1.2 times body weight. So you can see the magnitudes of the forces on walking. We're looking at something not over 1.1 to 1.2 times body weight, and actually in the middle of the middle of walking. So when I'm talking about the middle of mid stance, we actually have less than one body weight uh, occurring. Now, when we start doing slower running, and this is typically going to be a rear foot strike, 
Uh, matter of fact, the, of all the studies being done, 90% uh, of runners are rear-foot strikers. So the, the mis there is a common misconception that somehow forefoot strike and midfoot striking is a better way to run. That's never been shown to be the case. In fact, many elite marathoners run heel strike. So this heel strike impact peak is seen here. Oh, there it's working again. Impact peak or, uh, is our passive peak and the propulsive peak. This is typical. We can see again the time duration. We're looking at a little, uh, a little under 250 milliseconds or a quarter of a second. And that's the initial strike of the heel on the ground. And then the propulsive peak is when the center of mass, so that's when here's your impact peak and then as your center of mass comes over the foot and you're balanced like this, that's when this second peak occurs, which we call the propulsive peak. In faster running, such as sprinting, we don't have the impact peak curve, the little initial spike, because we're not hitting on the heel. You have to be hitting on the heel to get that initial peak. And that's going to be a faster running. Again, we see in faster running, we go from 250 milliseconds to under 200 milliseconds. That's going to be more of a sprinting type of speed. Again, let's talk about stance phase duration. Walking, typical walking is about 600 milliseconds depending on the speed of, uh, speed of walking. When we start getting into the slower running, we're looking at about a quarter of a second or 250 milliseconds. And when we get into faster running durations, we're looking at around 200 milliseconds or we can go down to almost 150 milliseconds in the greatest sprinter. So uh, as we go faster and faster, less time on the ground, more time in the air. As we go slower and slower, more time on the ground, and less time in the air. What else do we see with faster running? One of the things that most people don't understand is that as we go faster, the ground reaction force magnitudes increase dramatically. In world-class sprinters, you're looking at a ground reaction force magnitudes of five times body weight. In slow jogging speeds, you're looking at two times body weight. So we can see that the magnitude, here's body weight on, a, uh, here's a body weight here, and you can see here in slow running is about the same, but you can see the body weights here in walking are much less. So in walking, ground reaction force, typically 1.25 maximum. Uh, you sometimes will see uh, higher depending on how fast they're walking. Faster walking, of course, they're going to hit harder. Running, though, it's typical to have the ground reaction force be 2.5 to approximately three times body weight. And then with the sprinting, uh, and with sprinting speeds, uh, five times body weight. This is a video of a uh, world, basically a national class sprinter. He's actually running on a treadmill, 25 miles per hour. That's fast. Now you gotta remember, it's, it's just almost easy to run faster. You can almost run faster on a treadmill, not because it's moving underneath you, because you don't have wind resistance. So normally you can imagine a 25 mile an hour wind hitting against you, running over ground, that slows you down some, whereas on these treadmills, what they'll do, they'll hook them up to a harness so they, they, if they fell, they you know, really get hurt. But this shows the mechanics. But I want you to look at the ground reaction force curve here. 850 to 900 pounds. This guy probably weighs about 180. Huge. And these are all videos I've taken off the internet. So if you, any of you want the links to these, just email me. Uh, privately and I can send you the links and you guys can look at these. Obviously it's a lot better having them on your own computer. But pretty impressive the five times the body weight. So let's talk about modeling. The difference between walking and running and modeling. Modeling simply means we're trying to make a complex system more simplified so we can understand it better. And the way we do this with walking to understand the energy exchange is to say that walking is like an inverted pendulum. A pendulum swings back and forth like this, but in walking, our bodies are swinging like this over planet foot. So when we look at the inverted pendulum model, we're seeing that the center of mass is behind the foot when it starts. It rises over the planet foot, and then it falls. Here we have another diagram. Lower. Higher center of mass, lower. 
And that's the path of the, that is the path we see in walking. Center of mass moves over the arc of a stance fixed foot. This creates an ability for us to have a potential energy and kinetic energy exchange where at the highest point of the center of mass, the potential energy is greatest because it's a larger distance from the ground. And we start picking up speed as we go down. The kinetic energy, kinetic energy builds up at the bottom, but the potential energy is at the lowest because it's lower to the ground. So we have this, just like a pendulum swings like this, that's the way we maintain energy in walking. We maintain energy by having going from going from a low potential energy and high kinetic energy, high potential energy and low kinetic energy falling out again. And so we have these potential and kinetic energy exchanges occurring again and which are very helpful for us to maintain metabolic efficiency as we move from point A to point B utilizing bipedal walking locomotion. Running, however, is very different than walking. Running is what we consider best modeled by using what we call a spring mass model. Spring mass model means that we have a mass, so that's, let's say our center of mass is represented by one mass over the spring, which is our leg and our thigh and our knee and our ankle and the hip. And what is happening in this case is that the center of mass, when we hit and running, is above compresses the leg spring, so we store internal elastic strain energy within the muscles and tendons of our, of our body. And then we spring up by releasing this as kinetic energy, moving up and over to the next footstep. So this leg spring releases this kinetic energy from the middle of mid support up, and this is what allows us to maintain energy efficiency during running, and what makes running such an efficient locomotion mechanism for the bipedal human. One of the other models being used for running as a kinetic and uh, potential energy exchange are pogo sticks or bouncing balls. It's really the same thing. When a bouncing ball hits the ground and it compresses it's storing elastic strain energy, then it releases that and, and uh, rises up again. Same thing with a pogo stick. A kid on a pogo stick, he hits the ground, compresses the spring, and it relaxes up. That's what we do with running also. And this idea of the legs and the tendons of the, uh, of the human uh, lower extremity being springs is nothing new. This, uh, these ideas have been around for over 50 years. Uh, it is well accepted within the international biomechanics community, and this is not just in, uh, not just in humans, but in all the members of the animal kingdom that run, gallop, and trot. Here's a paper I took this from. This is looking at the muscular force in turkeys. I was an animal physiology, uh, animal physiology major, did a lot of exercise physiology stuff at UC Davis. So the animal stuff has always been fascinating to me because we can make direct correlations to how us as humans move. Here's a look at a kangaroo. Um, and, uh, and you can see, the, if you've ever been to Australia and see these guys out in the wild and jumping, uh, what's interesting about kangaroos is they actually hop faster and faster. They're not really using that much more energy. In humans, as we run faster and faster, we're using more and more energy. But in, in, they're so efficient at utilizing the, uh, the elastic spring within their tendon units that they actually don't spend much more energy to go faster and faster. So this is kind of a mechanism that we use also, obviously to a lesser extent than the kangaroos and wallabies do, to allow us to run more efficiently. One of the classic, and this is something I, I, I really encourage, you know, as you all know, uh, I've been lecturing on these topics for 33 years, but I'm fascinated by a lot of these things. and. Uh, one of, I try to, when I give these lectures, try to suggest there are certain papers that you need to read. And this is a great paper. This is done in 1987 by Kerr Bennett, uh, R. McNeil Alexander, who's one of the best, well, he's now passed away, but uh, written some of the best books on animal locomotion. But they, what they did, they took uh, fresh frozen cadaver specimens and set them up into this uh, they, into this jig where they have a load cell that measures their vertical forces, but then they have a steel plate with roller bearings here and put the foot on, the dissected foot into it, and we're actually trying to measure 
simulate running, trying to decide how much energy does the plantar fascia, the plantar ligaments, return back to the system when they load it up. So they're basically cycling as they're putting in the compression. And what they found was that a full 17, oops, sorry, we go backwards here. A full 17 joules of energy was stored in the compliant elements of the arch. That's going to include your plantar fascia or plantar aponeurosis, plantar ligaments. And then uh, also the Achilles tendon stored 35 joules of energy. And they, their conclusion was from their study that the human arch actually stores sufficient uh, elastic strain energy to make running more efficient. So we can't just think that foot is just you know, just pronating a supinate, we've got to think of their feet, having a foot that has a flexible arch that has strong muscles is actually able to contribute to this, the ligaments and plantar fascia can contribute to our metabolic efficiency during running. Can we have the audio up on this, please? No audio? It worked this morning. You can press the audio button. See, this is what happens. You come in the morning, it works, and then you come here and you give your lecture, it doesn't work. Anyway, let's forget about it. Sorry, this guy, I'll just tell you quickly about this guy. This is Danny Dreyer, he's the, uh, he teaches chi running. And he's saying how never let your foot go in front of your hips in running. It's bad. You should always land with your foot under your hip. And then he does a book, and he does classes and videos to sell this method of running. But when you look at his book, that's him. The way to fix the problem ah. is to remember one thing. There you go. Thank you. you don't ever there. step past your hip. What do I mean by that? That means that every time my foot lands, when I'm running, Every time my foot lands in my, the support phase of my stride, the waves are facing the ground underneath me. It's not a matter of one thing, a little behind you. Don't ever step past your hip. What do I mean by that? That means that every time you're a So the main ruling idea you want to keep inside your head is to never let your feet get ahead of your hips. Okay, so now he's told you how you should be running with this new chi running method. You gotta buy the video, buy the book to learn how to do it, or have him pay you to teach how to run correctly. But when you look at his book and the cover of his book, there's a center of mass, and there's his foot in front of us. He basically is telling you, don't do like I'm showing my book, do it like I'm showing a video. So this is the type of BS that's being sold, has been sold, and I've been fighting, I mean, as you all know, I got involved, we had the lecture about the Chris McDougall. Chris McDougall called me the angry podiatrist because I said that his book on Born Run was a semi-fiction because half of it was BS, and he didn't like it. So the bottom line is that you have to be careful about all these things that are happening on the internet and all these new trends that are coming on. You gotta be very, I say, you gotta be a skeptical podiatrist because there's so much BS being trying to sold out to make money on. And I, I think we gotta be vigilant about this as a, as a community. Here's Danny Dreyer teaching people to run at four miles an hour. <laughs> well, of course you're gonna put your foot on your hip if you're running at a walking pace. But I mean, here's pictures of other runners Foot in front of the hips, foot in front of the hips, foot in front of the hips. Here's a kid, here's Ben Kefalski. He's uh, one of the world's best marathoners, America's best marathoner. Foot always lands in front of the hip. Why does the foot need to land in front of the hip? Because in running, we always break when our center of mass is behind the foot, and we always push off as our foot is behind us, our center of mass moves ahead. It's a natural thing. All runners break and then propel, break and propel. And they say, oh no, you shouldn't break because that's their, their philosophy. Oh, if you land with your foot under your hip, you won't have to break and you make it go faster. Well, that's not the way the bipedal human runs. And why? I already told you why. Because we gotta store elastic strain energy in our legs when we first hit the ground. We have to hit the ground 
store lacks of strain energy in the time when we have maximum storage and our serum mass is the lowest, we can then release that lack of strain energy to push us forward. And this gets back to the spring mass model that we need to have that breaking force, a backwards force on our foot initially, followed by the propulsion force in order for the bipedal human to run effectively and efficiently without falling forward. But because you gotta understand, not only do we need to run and transfer force, we need to not be jerking back and forth and falling forward. We need to keep our, our, our body constantly upright and stable so we're not tilting side to side too much, which wastes energy. We're moving forward or backwards and moving our head about when we run. When you see a good runner, their head just kind of goes like this. It's not wobbling back and forth. Their body's very efficient. So we need to have the foot ahead of our center of mass. Don't listen to Danny Gerard, he's full of you know what. Uh, you need to have the foot ahead of the center of mass when you hit, and therefore that's why 90% of the runner's heel strike. As it comes over, we've gone from breaking to no breaking to pushing off. So we're pushing backwards on the ground here, we're pushing forwards on the ground here. That's natural, that's normal. Don't let someone tell you that it shouldn't occur. It does occur and it has to occur, and it's something that we need to understand as podiatrists because we get a lot of these crazy runners who, oh yeah, I read this new book. It's telling me I shouldn't do this and that. And you go, oh, you <laughs> Here's Meb in the 2010 Boston Marathon. I did this, uh, you know when you do these PowerPoint lectures? Sometimes you've got to work for an hour on one slide, and this is one of the slides, and I'll show you why. So here's Meb. I took this is a video of him running the 2010 Boston Marathon. And they're running about 505 mile pace right here. So here's what happens: the ground reaction force vector is going to go through his center of mass, and that's typically what happens. The center of the ground reaction force vector is going to basically track the center of mass and initial heel, and you can see. This guy's running a 505 mile heel as a heel striker. So don't believe someone when they say that you need to run midfoot or forefoot striking in order to be a good runner. Here's one of the best marathons in the world, heel strike. So you see how the ground reaction force is pointed toward the center of mass? That means it's a backwards directed, that's a braking force. The component, the, the horizontal component of that force is this way. No, that's a braking force. So let's imagine I cut and pasted the map and I moved his body forward here. So he was leaned forward. So here, let's say he did, he listened to Danny Dreyer. I said, okay, I listened to Danny Dreyer. I'm now I'm gonna put my foot and hit the ground with my foot under my center mass. See where the ground reaction force vector is now? So what's gonna to happen to poor Meb? <laughs> That's what it took an hour. <laughs> I get, you know, I, I, I'm 61 years old, you know, I, I, I'm pretty computer literate, but as I get older, I'm finding, I, it's, sometimes I try to find someone young to say, how do you do this thing? It's like, <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about running on varus. Something else that's important. Now, running on varus doesn't really occur when you're jogging. You know, you're going at a four mile, five mile, uh, per, mile per hour pace. This is actually a picture of my legs when I was fit. Uh, not like I am now, gray, bald, and getting fat. But this is my leg standing up. Here's me running on the, actually, that's actually Ar Arlene you'd appreciate. This is on the parking lot at CCPM. <laughs> As we were up there when I was a biomechanics fellow. But that's showing that you can see that's almost a 15 degree change in angle of my tibia going. That's, I'm running at about a five minute mile pace. We just ran across to some photos. But you can see the running on Barris that occurred. And so what happens in standing and walking, generally our, our center of support is fairly wide, but as we go faster and faster running, we bring the feet under the ground more, which increases the varus attitude. And here's some pictures of some female runners showing their varus. It's going to be very, it doesn't occur with all runners, but it does occur in some runners quite a bit, and that's something we have to be cognizant of. And as we go into this running on varus situation, probably we're doing it as a, our brain is telling us to do that because it's more efficient when we're taking a long step to put, to put our foot under our center of mass than to put it sideways because if you're putting it sideways, you're gonna be moving back and forth versus wanting to keep your head straight ahead when you're running.
and that's the running of Embarrass. It doesn't occur with everyone, but it is important in some people. And the, uh, the next thing, we're just going to go briefly across this. Of course, uh, if you really want to get into muscle activity while walking versus running, you're looking at about an hour lecture. So I'm just going to just briefly talk about the differences. <coughs> is that an EMG activity of running is obviously different because in running, what we're doing, we're spending a lot of our muscle activity because we're only on the ground for about 200 to 250 milliseconds. We do a lot of our muscle activities preparing the body to hit the ground. So in walking, once we hit the ground, we've kind of done a little bit of preparation because it's 600 milliseconds or 700 milliseconds long. And running, the time on the ground is so short, we do, we start activating our muscles way before we even hit the ground. So let's look at the graphs. So here's the beginning of the initial contact. Here's the hip extensors, hamstrings, quadriceps, rectus femoris, gastrocellus, anterior tibia. Anterior tibial is basically used throughout because it's trying to obviously clear the foot and get it ready. But you look at the gastrocnemius; it's actually firing well ahead of contact. The rectus femoris, quadriceps, hamstrings, and the hip extensors are far firing well before we even hit the ground because they're preparing for the impact. They're preparing the muscles to get ready for the impact with the ground and then to push it off. So that's really the, probably the biggest take-home messages for walking and running is that running so much of the activity is right before the, uh, the foot hits the ground and especially the anterior tibial. Here we see the anterior tibial. That's, it's, it's active nearly the whole running the gait cycle. But, and this electromechanical delay, I'll just briefly mention it. I know that Dr. Hoffman is a physiology, I was a physiology. That's you know, something standard we teach in undergraduate, but that's the time from when the uh, signal is sent to the time the muscle contraction actually occurs, can be registered on your EMG, on your, from your EMG activity to the time the force is produced. It's about 50 milliseconds, so that does affect things. Anyway, what are the differences in walking and running? Let's review what we've talked about. These are important for us to understand as podiatrists, especially when we're treating runners. I treat a lot of runners. Dr. Mitchell treats a lot of runners. I'm sure many of you also treat a lot of runners. It's important to have these facts because the more knowledgeable you are and the more knowledgeable the runner perceives you to be, the more confidence they'll have you in your abilities to help them. The double full phase doesn't occur in walking, only occurs in running. There are different uh, ground reaction force curves, as we've mentioned before. Walking has a double hump. Running, slow running has the impact peak and propulsive peak. Faster running has just a propulsive peak. There's greatly increased magnitudes. Walking 1.1 to 1.5 maybe. Ground reaction force running 2.5 to 3. For normal running speeds up to five times body weight for sprinting speeds. Energetic models are different. Again, spring mass model for the running and the inverted pendulum for walking. Running lumbaris is something that we have to be aware of for the faster runners because this can cause increased rate of for pronation velocity during running and also the DM, different EMG activity. Thank you very much. And uh, don't believe because we're